Welcome back to the 8th Figure Attorney Podcast. I'm Seth Bader. I'm very happy to introduce my next guest. Uh, he's an 8th Figure Attorney himself, uh, partner at Shiver Hamilton. Jeff Shiver, welcome. Thank you, Seth. I appreciate it. Jeff, I want to get right into it. You've got multiple 8th Figure results, verdicts and settlements. Tell me about three recent uh, uh, results. Just tell me the, the results themselves, and then let's maybe we we'll talk about one or two of them. Okay. Um, recently, about a year ago, we had a, well, a year and a half ago now, uh, we had a $27 million wrongful death case down in Muscogee County, Columbus, Georgia. A young lady named Cindy Tran died in a tractor trailer crash when a tractor trailer pulled out in front of her. She was unable to stop and uh, she passed away. Beautiful 22 year old Army veteran. Uh, we had a $20 million case down in Clayton County. Um, Mr. Uh, Florencio Gomez Mendez was a tenant at an apartment complex um, managed by this company called Jamco. They had had numerous shootings, violence all over the property, had no meaningful security whatsoever. Um, really good case. The insurance company, for whatever reason, offered next to nothing. So we took that case to trial, got a $20 million verdict um, for his widow and children who were it's still living in Mexico, although the widow came back for trial, which is something I'll tell you about later. Um, and then our first uh, big verdict, um, eight-figure verdict, was a case called Hilario, where a young man died at a recycling facility down south of Atlanta. Uh, this company recycled everything from propane tanks to uh, cars. And they had this process when a car would come in, they'd have to take the fuel out of the car before they crushed it and then turned it into this ferrous metal scrap. Well, this crappy process that they designed, they didn't go to the market and buy the equipment that is designed to do that. They manufactured it themselves. It leaked gas all over the place. They would take these cars and put them on a steel spike with this big crane and then they would spike the tank to extract the fuel into this other tank mm -hmm. and as you can imagine um, fuel was spilling everywhere. Eric did the graveyard shift because at night they'd have to clean the yard so that the next day when people would bring in their equipment it would be clean for them to process and recycle. Eric, uh, the bucket of his front end loader hit some concrete, caused a spark. He was engulfed in flames and, uh, and died and that was a a $29 million wow. verdict. Wow. Je Jeff, talk to me. Uh, first, I, I noticed a few of those names were Hispanic. Mm -hmm. um, do you recall if those clients were undocumented or if they were documented? That's a great question. So Cindy was an American citizen. Um, she was uh, American Filipino mm -hmm. but um, and spoke English. Uh, Mr. Gomez Mendez was an undocumented um, gentleman from Mexico. And interestingly, <clears throat> his wife, was a Mexican citizen, but she lived in the Totsil community. So the, the Totsils are, um, it's kind of like the Mexican equivalent mm -hmm. of an American Indian. So they live on what's like a reservation. It's a Mayan, mm -hmm. uh, they're descendants of the Mayan community. And Totsil is its own language. So Pascuala, his wife, um, she had, she didn't have a, she didn't even have identification. Mm -hmm. She didn't have a passport, she didn't have a visa. We had to go through a really um, lengthy process to get her the documentation to come to trial. And then when she came to trial, we couldn't use a, a Spanish translator. We sure. had There were only two people in the world that we could identify that could translate from Totsil to English. And so um, anyway, she, she that was kind of a logistical challenge, but um, Flor Florencia was not a documented uh, worker and nor was Eric. He was not documented. So, so if I'm hearing you correctly, and of course I know this because I represent many undocumented uh, workers in workers' compensation cases, but for those that don't know, it sounds like undocumented uh, people here in the United States that get injured or undocumented uh, family members that have claims on behalf of, say, a deceased uh, a person here in the United States, they can still pursue claims. Absolutely. I mean, that's that to me is the beautiful thing about our system. You know, the, the civil justice system has many objectives, but there are chiefly two. One is to compensate the victim, mm. and the other is to deter and punish the wrongdoer. And fortunately, we don't draw an arbitrary line where we say, you know, those, those 
um, objectives of justice only apply to American citizens. Mm. Um, what I have seen over the years is that you know, a lot of these corporations that we have as defendants in our case, if they have an unsafe, um, an unsafe condition at a workplace, or if you're a tenant and there's mm-hmm. a dangerous condition on the property, there's no government agency that's mm. going to come and make sure that they are, are complying with certain rules and regulations. I mean, the only way to enforce things, say, for example, like security mm-hmm. um, at an apartment complex is civil potential civil liability. Mm. And so, um, fortunately, our, our lawmakers have decided that holding wrongdoers accountable and compensating victims mm-hmm. is far more important than drawing some arbitrary line based on citizenship. Explain to me uh, the role of trial lawyers like yourself in helping to improve safety, to help improve security, and what's the connection between the work that you do uh, in getting uh, results uh, and taking big corporations to trial and and winning verdicts and settlements and sort of how that improves safety and security uh, for, for, for people here in the United States? That's a great question. So the Hilario case that I mentioned where the young man died at the recycling facility. Mm -hmm. Um, They, as we got into that case, we filed the lawsuit, we sent subpoenas, we got all this documentation, we talked to all of these witnesses. Mm -hmm. Well, come to find out, and this is true in many of our cases, this wasn't just some freak accident. This was a cascade of events. There was a history of unsafe practices. Mm -hmm. Other employees who worked there had complained to their supervisors and had said, look, there's gas everywhere. This is not safe. We've got to come up with a better system to get the fuel out of these vehicles. And so whenever there's a workplace injury, for example, usually OSHA gets involved. And you think, well, okay, OSHA, the government, is going to hold these corporations and these employers accountable. Well, in spite of the evidence that there had been numerous complaints, this was a major safety issue, putting hundreds of workers out in that facility at risk, OSHA fined them, I think, $17,000. Wow. So if I'm a corporation and I know that eh, I've got this, this practice that's much more efficient, I'm saving a lot of money by not buying this equipment in the marketplace, and you know what? If it's not safe, somebody gets hurt, I might have to pay a fine, OSHA might hit me for ten, twenty, even $30,000, I don't have a lot of incentive to make my place safe. However, if I know well, you know what? I may not only be liable for OSHA's mm-hmm. penalties, but I might be liable in a civil trial. And I might be liable for the value of my worker's life or the value of the injury and what they go through. Then that's a different calculus. And after, you know, there are a few things that have occurred in my career that have, d- despite kind of the, the pushback plaintiff's lawyers get and the mm-hmm. stereotypes that are mm-hmm. there, and everybody's saying, well, you make insurance premiums go up. You know, there are a few things that have occurred that have kind of been my true north and have made me realize we actually are doing something that is achieving a greater societal good. It was after that verdict when I got a call from a reporter, just like lawyers have Mm -hmm. legal newspapers. Mm -hmm. um, The recycling industry had a publication. They've got a recycling magazine. And a reporter from this recycling magazine called and said, hey, we heard about this big verdict. Everybody in our industry is talking about it. Will you do an interview so I can put an article because people want to know what happened and how can they avoid being the defendant in the next mm. case? Now, granted, they weren't doing it out of the goodness of their own heart to protect their employers, but the net effect is the same. If they hear about that verdict and they realize, you know what, if you don't listen to your employees and if you don't make this place safe, then you can face significant liability, well then maybe it'll it'll make the place safer. Um, another example, in the Gomez case, this was an apartment complex that had crime upon crime upon crime. And in fact, we had represented, um, it's probably one of the clients that I've gotten closest to in my career, the Diaz family, mm. who lost their 13-year-old son mm. in a shooting at the same complex 18 months before Mr. Gomez Mendez died. Complex didn't do anything meaningful after Stephen died. Mm -hmm. So we pursued the Gomez Mendez case all the way through trial. Uh, Local law enforcement had been out to that that apartment 
dozens and dozens of times. Prosecutors had been trying to prosecute the criminals that were allowed to come on the property, and it made their job a lot harder because, you know, apartments are unique. You have high density living. And if mm-hmm. I'm a bad guy and I want to go find as many targets as I can, I'm going to go to an apartment complex where there's two, three hundred people in a half mile sure. radius. And so long story short, we were doing our closing argument and it was in Clayton County State Court and just down the hall was the district attorney's office. And when I sat down after giving my closing, my paralegal slipped a note that someone had given her and I opened it up and it was a note from an assistant district attorney in that office Mm. and just said, go get them. We're rooting for you. Mm. We are tired of prosecuting murders at this complex. Mm. And you know, that just, that really hit home to me that, you know, these negligent security cases, it's not just about compensating widows who've lost their husband. That's very important. I mean, that's probably the most important thing. But if a district attorney thinks that what we do makes her job easier and might make her community safer, then I think I'm on the right side of of the courtroom in this one. No doubt, no doubt. Talk to me just generally. You, you, you've got multiple eight-figure verdicts. You just mentioned three uh, over $20 million. Just a lot of people don't know how a jury can arrive at a $20 uh, million dollar verdict or how you can get a $20 uh, or $30 million settlement. Like Just generally speaking, how can a case, you know, why are some cases worth more in terms of value and in, in terms of compensation than others, and explain the relationship not only between sort of the the damages, the li- and liability, but also the importance of insurance and the types of insurance that are available. Okay. Well, obviously, at the there there are a couple of drivers in the value of cases. The first is are the damages, and it's kind of obvious, but. If you have a sprained wrist, Mm -hmm. your case is smaller than if you have a broken wrist. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously the worst types of damages are the catastrophic or the wrongful death cases. So you have a brain injury where someone might have two, three hundred thousand of medical bills Mm -hmm. for the rest of their life or a paralysis Mm -hmm. case and obviously the death case. Mm -hmm. Um, The other component is kind of the degree of negligence. Mm -hmm. What happened? So do you have a little old lady who just couldn't really see over the steering wheel and she ran a red light and made a one-time mistake? Or do you have a trucking company who has a dangerous driver? We have a case right now we're preparing for trial where a a truck driver ran a red light in the middle of the day, we have it on video, Hmm. and struck a car going through an intersection on a green light. A a mother of two beautiful Hmm. little girls was in the car. She was hit broadside, was in the hospital for a month, and died after being in the hospital for a month, leaving those two girls Mm -hmm. without a mother. The truck driver was acting oddly at the scene. They did a blood test, and turns out he was high on methamphetamine. Mm -hmm. Come to find out, as we pursued the case and took depositions, this truck driver had numerous instances in his driving history that should have alerted this company to him being a problem. And in fact, the last instance, which was also called on video, was reported to the company via their onboard uh, electronic monitoring equipment, and they didn't even act on it, didn't even look at it. And had they done so, based on his prior infractions, he should have been fired on the spot. So when you have a case like that, even if the damages were the same, mm-hmm. um, the, the kind of the egregiousness of that conduct usually will either give rise to a specific additional form of damages, punitive damages, or even attorney's fees, because if you, um, it's called bad faith in the transaction, if you knowingly violate safety regulations, you can not only be liable for punitive damages, but you can be liable for the other side's attorney's fees. I see. Um, And the other component I would say is, um, you know, there are times when we go to trial, like the recycling industry case I told you about, Mm -hmm. there are times we go to trial and the defendant's defense is we did nothing wrong. Mm. Everything we did was right. The plaintiff's allegations are inaccurate and the process we had was safe and reasonable. Mm. And when you have facts that a jury 
on their face can look at and decide, this ain't right. I, as a lawyer, if my case is good and I present the case as a story and I show them the defendant's egregiousness rather than just try to force it down their throat, juries are smart. You've got 12 people on juries, and if they just had an average IQ of 100, you're looking at a collective body of a 1,200 IQ. That Each juror is not going to get everything, but collectively they will. And if you've got to respect juries and you've got to understand they're smart, don't force your thoughts down their throat. Show them that the defendants were careless by calling witnesses and putting in evidence. And if that jury determines this ain't right, I, when you have workers who say that gas spilling on the ground makes them unsafe mm-hmm. and they would like a new process and you ignore it, and an 18-year-old boy it burns to death, mm-hmm. and then you come into court and look at us with a straight face and tell us this is how, this is how the world works, that's how you get a big verdict. Mm-hmm. Because the jury, instead of saying, what do we have to do to compensate this family for losing their son? What's, what's going to send these family, this family home with enough money to take care of them? That's the way to get a good verdict. But the way to get a verdict that really can, can transcend one particular case and actually do some good is when a jury says, what do I have to do to get their attention? Mm-hmm. What, what do we have to do as a jury? They, this happened. This was their process. This is bullshit. This lawyer just came in two years later in the face of this young dead young man and told basically his grieving parents what we did was okay and we're going to keep doing it. That's when a jury says, we're going to do something about it. And guess what? The jury has one tool, and that's a verdict. And so they speak to the defendant through their verdict. And it's not necessarily punitive damages, but it's the verdict deciding we're going to step in the story and we're going to be the hero and we're going to right this wrong for this guy and we hope everyone else pays attention. That's great stuff, Jeff. And then talk to me about insurance. I mean, clearly, well, you, you just outlined a couple of things and variables that go into a, an eight-figure verdict. Uh, one was the degree of damages. One was not only the, the, the degree of negligence, but sort of the egregiousness uh, of, of, of the actions of the defendant. Um, but talk to me about insurance. In other words, Let's say you have a great case in terms of, the, I shouldn't say great, but let's say you have a case, a tragic case with really high damages, really egregious negligence, but you don't have insurance. I mean, how important is the insurance to actually collecting for your client? Well, that is a highly contextual question. Um, usually, and let's, let's take it into the world of car wrecks, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you've got a 24-year-old kid crosses the center line drunk and kills kills a family of three. That kid, if he's like most 24-year-old kids, he doesn't have any assets. And you've got what could be a $100 million case. And you can go to trial. You have every right to go to trial and get as big of a verdict against that young man as you can possibly get. But most likely, there is, if he has, say, 100000 of insurance, your family's going to collect $100,000. And it's tempting as a lawyer to get fired up about these cases and say, well, I'm going to, I'm going to extract justice from this kid. We're going to, even if we have to collect $50 a month for him for the rest of the life, he ruined our family's lives and our family's entitled to a piece of paper that speaks the truth of their loss. What I've learned over the years, there, when there's a lawsuit pending, mm-hmm. you know, the family, they're doing their best to process a tremendous loss. Families, you know, say parents lost a kid. Mm-hmm. Um, we can't do anything to really help them through that. I mean, we we work our cases and work with them in a way that lets them know their loss is driving what we do. Mm-hmm. But there's also this open chapter in their recovery. Not even uh, recovery is the wrong word in their their progress to whatever the next chapter is of their loss. That chapter stays open until the lawsuit is closed. Uh, I've seen it in every single death case we've ever handled. Mm. And so if I don't, you know, every client that lost a loved one has their own, uh, their own goals that they're trying to achieve. And it's not just about money, but what I try to remind them of is going against that young man to get that symbolic verdict doesn't is not going to give you the closure and satisfaction that you think it it might Um, 
the the other component of, of insurance, um, there are times when you can collect more than the insurance if they the insurance company doesn't pay. Mm-hmm. If you make a reasonable settlement offer to the young man's insurance company for the hundred thousand, they get greedy and say, "Well, we think these people might take eighty thousand, and then they reject your offer. There is a way to go to trial, get that hundred million dollar verdict, and then have the young man sue his insurance company for not accepting your reasonable settlement offer. And what is that called? That's called bad faith. And, and so can you just very briefly explain what that is? Yes, absolutely. So let's put ourselves in the place of the young man. We have caused a tremendous accident. Mm-hmm. We've paid insurance premiums for two years to Progressive. I'm mm-hmm. just picking out Progressive. Sure. This is not a real life story. But we've paid our premiums for years for protection. The deal you make with your insurance company is I'm paying you premiums. If I screw up and cause a wreck, and they offer to settle with me, you, the insurance carrier, are gonna pay that settlement on my behalf. If the family comes to me and progressive and says, this is a huge case, we recognize you only have 100,000 of coverage, we're willing to accept only your 100,000, young man, we're not gonna try to collect your assets, we're not gonna try to take your Xbox player and your car, Uh, we're gonna just settle for the insurance limits. Well, if the insurance company says no, that's a rejection. And then the family's lawyer, if he's smart, he or she, will say, well, we're going to go to trial and get a $100 million verdict because you've caused a $100 million injury. Fast forward, you go to trial because the insurance company rejected your offer. You get the big verdict. And then the young man who caused the wreck goes to Progressive and says, wait a minute. They offered to settle for $100,000, mm-hmm. which is my limits. I paid you to settle it. You refused because you were greedy trying to save 20000 Now there's a $100 million judgment against me. I'm suing you. Progressive for breach of contract, for negligence, for bad faith, making me go through this and now having a hundred million being saddled with a hundred million dollar judgment. And then what that young man does, this is really granular and complicated, but what that young man does is he says, Hey, family who lost their loved one, you have a judgment against me. I've got this big claim against progressive because they didn't pay it. Mm-hmm. I will pursue progressive for the full amount because they're the ones that caused this to happen. And then if there is a recovery, I will then take that and satisfy the judgment with what I receive, the judgment you have against me Mm -hmm. with what I receive from Progressive. Understood. So that's bad faith. That's bad faith. And again, you were just giving a hypothetical, not talking about Progressive. That bad faith uh, law uh, uh, could actually apply to any insurance company. Any insurance company, that's right. So so Jeff, let's, let's just shift gears to trial work. You're a trial lawyer, um, and I know every every trial lawyer, you know, has his or her own style, and and they've learned things along the way. You referenced sh- earlier when you were telling me about one of the the cases. You talked about uh, showing the jury, mm-hmm. not just telling them. Mm-hmm. Is, is that? And I know that's something we've talked about in the past. But tell me about that. W- w- is that something you've learned? And and if so, talk to me about the importance that you place on showing the jury the case, not just telling them. Yep. Well, that goes back to respecting the jury's intelligence. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as lawyers, we we overdo it. We think we're the only ones who get it in the room. We're trained to talk in this weird way using these big legal terms that no one in the real world uses, and that makes us feel smart. And so we go to trial, and we feel like we've got to spoon feed these grown Adults who have navigated this complicated world perfectly fine before we got in there. <laughs> sure. And so, you know, in, I learned from a guy named John Peters, a, a defense lawyer, the finest trial lawyer I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. And John was perfect at knowing exactly what pieces of a story to put out there at trial and then let the jury put the pieces together. And, it, and if you think about it, you're married, I'm married. Our wives are brilliant, most likely, at learning how to make something our idea, right? If they tell us, I want to do this, I want to do that, mm-hmm. I'm, me, I'll use me, I don't want to pick on you, but, but I might be more inclined to bristle. Whereas if she makes it my idea, then suddenly it, I'm enthused about it. Well, that's the way everybody is. You make it their idea. Mm-hmm. So instead of telling a jury what to think, mm-hmm. you tell the jury, this guy's speeding, this corporation is bad. What you do is you tell the story in a way that shows defendant truck driver got up on Monday morning, got into his truck, forgot to do a pre-trip. Got in his truck, it was 8.45, he was supposed to be there at 8.30. He gets 
on Highway 82 West and puts it in fifth gear. He passes the speed limit sign that says 55 miles an hour. He accelerates. He's going approximately 60, 62 miles an hour. He passes by. So you, you just tell the story in a way where the jury knows, this guy's running late. I didn't tell the jury he's late. I just told him what time it was. I told him what time he had to be at his appointment. I didn't tell the jury he was speeding. I just told the jury how fast he was driving and what the speed limit was. Just tell it in a way that the jury sees what is going on, and then when they go back into the jury room, they're going to talk about it. One of the jurors is going to say, that guy was running late. Did you hear what time he was supposed to be there? Did you hear what time it was? And then suddenly, instead of the jury resisting what this lawyer, who they know has an agenda, is trying to make them think, I've just shown them the building blocks, and they've put those building blocks together. And to me, some of the best advice I've ever gotten, I was walking out the door to go try a case, and, and my boss at the time said, Shiver, whatever you're going to do, whatever you think you're going to do and you're planning to do, do 75%. Dial it back. I think a trial lawyer's biggest asset is restraint. Mm. If you can know that I need to dial it back a little bit, the jury gets it, no one to shut up, no one to not ask that next question. Mm -hmm. That's usually when, or like we talk about in some of these other cases, know when the defense is making your case for you. Mm. In that that recycling case um, trial, the witnesses were saying all of these things and then the defense's position had changed halfway through the litigation and we made that a chief component of our case. When the defense lawyer stood up and in the first 10 seconds of his opening statement, he made the comment, Ladies and gentlemen, I know that the plaintiffs have said this and that and the other, but facts change. The facts changed. Mm -hmm. Facts don't change. Facts <laughs> are actually quite stubborn, if you think about it. <laughs> and so we knew in that case, if they continue on this strategy, we don't. We, we can dial it back because they're going to hang themselves. So we're just going to give them the rope and let them hang themselves. Mm. I want to go back in time. But...